Guys, I am so, I was telling them all this backstage that I'm like such a geek for all of these shows and it's so lovely to be on a panel with so many talented people. So thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start off by first off acknowledging that all of your shows are these wonderful shows that really don't take the easy way out. I mean, it's so easy to do a sitcom and let it be sitcom-y or do a, friend, uh, like a show about a group of friends. And look, I love shows about groups of friends, not to, not to poop on them. But um, what you all do is hard. It's really, really hard. And I wanted to know sort of what show was it that made you sort of develop a passion for this avenue of storytelling, for the, the sitcom that does something more? I mean, I think we're, well, you guys, I'll let them deal with the Norman Lear part of it because I don't work <laughs> with him on my show. So, um, but honestly, for me, I think it was Cheers, which is probably not an, uh, necessarily an answer that um, you would think that they are dealing with social topics. But if you go back and watch Cheers, which is my all time favorite sitcom, S Sam Malone was an alcoholic who ran a bar, who ruined his career, who just wanted to be loved, who couldn't figure out how to do these. I mean, it's a very real, heavy kind of topic, even though that was such a fun show. And I think that's probably the first time that I, as a young person, connected with the show and thought, oh, they're, they're talking about really real things here. And I, and I laughed, you know? Yeah. Bob? Yeah, I mean, that was... I mean, that was a great answer, Danielle. Oh, um, um, yeah, I, I, I've, I, I've all, Cheers is, was a big thing for me too because I've, I always have been attracted to the shows that show the darkness under the, under the light, and I feel like the great shows. I'm gonna now I'm gonna date myself and say that um, uh, when I was a kid, my favorite show, which I watched in reruns, not lot, not <laughs> real, was uh, the Dick Van Dyke Show. Um, and they did some amazing, I, people have forgotten this, but they did some, a couple of great, really interesting episodes about race, uh, an episode where they thought, Rob thought they had brought home the wrong baby from the hospital and it ended up being an African-American couple that he thought he had switched with. Um, but I think even as a kid, that somehow filtered into my, my consciousness and, um, you know, uh, the, sort of the subtlety which, with, with which they did that was really interesting to me. I'm, I kind of, you know, I come from the feature world, so uh, there is a TV show, but you, <laughs> the connection is dubious, but it's Golden Girls, you know. Uh, oh my God, absolutely. <laughs> Obvi. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, stu the stuff that goes on in the Golden Girls, like, you can't find that stuff on network TV anymore. I mean, they really go there. But I think, you know, it was probably um, Do the Right Thing had a big impact on me, uh, as did a, a movie called Network and Election. Those are three movies that are multi-protagonist movies, uh, you know, like the film on which my show is based, where you feel really uncomfortable and love, but kind of loathe everyone by the end of them. And, um, you know, that's the experience that, like, I wanted to create with the movie and, and pretty much extend over a larger canvas mm -hmm. uh, to explore these really, really hard to talk about uh, topics that really don't have a single answer from one viewpoint. So I would say all of those kind of influenced... Um, you know, sort of convinced me that I could do this as a show. Yeah. Um, I think I come, I think my, the way my brain came at it is more liking to combine drama and comedy in the same thing. I don't think I've, I, I certainly have social concerns and I get wound up about issues and stuff, but, and I watched Norman shows growing up, kind of, uh, in repeats. I, I'm, I'm 24. Um, <laughs> but, but there was something about like certain, <laughs> Sophie's Choice was a weird thing to bring up in a, normally in a comedy show, but like, and uh, E.T., I remember those two movies that I cried in the movie theater. Like I, and that was a new experience for me. And later, you know, when I was actually working in television and we were developing Men of a Certain Age, I was watching Friday Night Lights, and it was also like, it just had such impact. And so then after those, after those, after we didn't, after I did Men of a Certain Age, it was sort of like every comedy after that was like, I just want to do something that also includes a lot of emotion in it somehow. And uh, I think that, you know, goes with what Norman's stuff is that we're doing now. Yeah, totally. Oh, wait, Gloria, do you not have a mic? Oh, I don't. Here. I mean, we can share. We're so used to. Oh, all right. Yeah, Mike, you can take that one. I, I was always really moved by the very special episodes. <laughs> do you guys remember, like, I mean, I can't, I don't know how to ride a bike still. Part of me thinks it's because Arnold and the bike shop and the, the child molester, a little bit. Do you remember that in different strokes? Uh, I really loved though, and Tom Hanks playing like the alcoholic uh, brother, uncle on like Family Ties. Like I loved those episodes. I, I was so blown away by the fact that I could be laughing at something and then also learn something and feel something. I, I thought that was such an incredible thing. So 
to, that's, I mean, not to say that we're making a very special episode every week, but in a way that's kind of what was uh, interesting to, to attempt. Well, I want to talk about that because, um, like Justin, you come from the feature world. What was it like to kind of go into a series and know that you had to take your narrative, take your point, and, and break it up into 10 hours versus two hours? Well, it was five hours because we're a half hour, so it was a oh, little bit easier true. for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, actually, that part of it was pretty uh, organic for me. You know, again, like, uh, Dear White People, is a, it's a multi-protagonist movie. So, like, if, you know, I, I kind of always wanted to make the sort of, you know, five-hour version of it if any audience could stand something like that. And so, you know, for me, I, I definitely, I sort of, um, you know, I, I grew up on, like, Robert Altman. And these movies were, like, every character has their own sort of short film kind of warming its way through this bigger movie. And I thought, you know... That, that my first instinct was like, gosh, it would be really great to do this as a streaming show because, you know, you can sort of binge the whole thing as this kind of like extended piece and then episode by episode, you know, go one kind of short film at a time where we get into what these characters are going through while this sort of bigger uh, plot is happening on, you know, the campus of Winchester. So that part of it for me actually was kind of organic and kind of, you know, you, you, th you see things like MASH translating to, to TV really well. It was sort of kind of the same thing. It's like, you know, I didn't really, you never really have enough room in an hour and 47 minutes to explore that many characters. So it was kind of easier, actually, to, to, to deal with them uh, over a canvas of, say, five hours. Right. So for everybody else that kind of does, like, the episode subjects or the, tell me, take me into your writer's room. How does... How, does, how do you sit down and decide this week we're taking on gentrification or this week we're taking on race or whatever it might be? Like how you're do those... You're looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did those episodes. Yeah. Um, uh, we were always looking for things that are difficult to talk about and we were always looking for things that don't have a uh, clear answer. Th those were our favorite episodes to tell. So we, um, the Carmichael show is very much a, a conversational show. It's a, it's a, it's a, family debate really every week. Um, and any time the writers started fighting, we knew that, okay, that, that's, we're in a really good territory. If people were, and if people were really screaming at each other like I needed to call a timeout, like a recess, then I, then I really knew that there was something good. So we were just looking for interesting, we're always looking for interesting things to talk about. Um, and, and not necessarily um, looking at the news and what's happening in the news, but just what's happening in your life, what's impacting your life, what's hard right now, and kind of trying to approach it from that angle. And so does it start with somebody coming in and being like, I had a terrible day yesterday, this is what happened, or? Yeah, sometimes you're like, I'm upset because this thing is going on. I mean, it, you know, it is what's happening in the world. We're, we're, you know, obviously we're here talking about things that are socially relevant, but not like, you know, Trump did this today, so let's try and answer it with that, because I think if you try and chase the headline that's hard, I mean, I guess there are shows that do it, like uh, Law and Order, that's what they do, right? That's what, but like, you know, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's just about finding something that's relevant to our characters. We would only do a story if we, if some one of our characters had something to say about it. There could be amazing stories out there that maybe someone else's show could do, but none of the Carmichaels really had a take on it. So we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't touch that necessarily. Uh, we actually had a PA um, at the beginning of the season. Cause they come, go online and come up with a list of like issues we could address someday. And it came back and it was like nuclear disarmament. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm probably not going to handle that one in a donut shop. But yeah, for us, I think, as Danielle said, it, it, um, it came out of, it really has to come out of character. And we just look at, you know, Jermaine Fowler plays a 28-year-old African-American man working a minimum wage job without health insurance. Like, that, that, lead, that led to stories. Judd Hirsch plays a 75-year-old man who's been clinging to this business in a gentrifying neighborhood. How can he survive this changing, in this changing world? That gave us stories. Maz Jabani played an Iraqi immigrant. That gave us an interesting story about him being kind of racially profiled. So yeah, it really has to come, I think, initially out of, the, out of who the characters are and, and, and what, what are they going through in their, in their daily lives. Why are you all laughing about nuclear? I want to know. That was like an inside joke or something. Because Norman literally came into, can we do something about nuclear disarmament? You know, like. <laughs> Good luck, he, we he tried. Had, yeah. He had a meeting with, he's, he's forever, I mean, he's the president of the world, you know. He's, he's, so he, he conferences and uh, he's always, the, the phone rings and it's like, oh, it's, uh, you know, Clint, Bill Clinton, I have to talk to him. Like, he's always, he's in the middle of everything it's important. Yeah. So. So yes, like two weeks ago, he, he had some meeting that was 
somewhere in the neighborhood of nuclear issues, and he was like, can we, I kind of talked to them, and if we can do anything about nuclear disarmament, you know, we have a character who gets very wound up about a lot of different causes, so there may be something. We don't, we don't think we have an episode. <laughs> anyway. How are, so for you all, how does that story process begin or, or work? Because I especially remember the episode that really centered on Rita Moreno's character last, in season one, that really touched on immigration, and, but in a totally kind of different way than, you know, say the Carmichael show might address something yeah. like that. Tell me about how ideas begin and evolve in, in your writer's room. All right. <laughs> uh, well, we, I think we talk about first, I mean, the, the exciting thing about being one of the few Latino sitcoms on the air is that we have a lot that we want to talk about that hasn't really been exhausted yet. So we kind of start from there. And the, the deportation episode that you're speaking about, I, I spoke on the last panel about it briefly. Norman said it would be great to do an episode, maybe, you know, Rita's character you know, is, is threatened with being deported. And I had to educate him and let him know, like, Cubans can't be deported, Norman. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. That's so exciting. So, <laughs> <laughs> so then it's that discussion. It's the discussion of uh, different immigrants in this country and how they're treated differently. And how do we tell that story in a hopefully responsible way? And uh, we, we lean a lot. We lean heavily on my parents' experience. I'm a first-generation American. My parents came here in 1962 from Cuba. But they were in foster care and got to you know, become citizens and get jobs, et cetera. I was able to go to college, and they were able to buy homes. And uh, you know, my experience is different than other first generations that come to this country. So I am aware of my privilege, and, uh, and I think it was worthwhile to discuss it. And we, we did in that episode while talking about this Mexican family who is going through a very different thing of being deported. Mm -hmm. So it was great. And, and that's, that's kind of how we look at it. And we, we talk about... We, because we're doing only 13 episodes, unlike a, a network where you're, my God, 22, I remember that, and it just <laughs> hurts my heart to think about. Because 17 and 18 are never good, guys. It's just, just don't watch this. Sometimes uh, 12, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we have found with 13, it's, it's, we really feel like, we really feel good about all the episodes we made last year and the ones that we've broken this year. And with that amount of time, we talk first as showrunners about the stories that we're passionate about telling. Then we come to the room and they come with all of these great ideas and, and all of that kind of gets bounced around and, and then we come together and make the season. Mm -hmm. um, you said the word responsibility. Um, obviously with all of the topics that you all tackle comes a great response, with great power comes great responsibility, I've been, heard, I've been told. Um, tell me about how that weighs on you and also how you go about getting it right. Like what's, What's the trick to doing that? Um, we, we had a, this was Gerard Carmichael's idea, and I think he was inspired by um, Bill Cosby in a good way. Um, <laughs> uh, because Cosby had a, who was, it was the doctor, he was a doctor who was a consultant on the show of family, he was a ther therapist or a PhD or something who, anyway, consulted on the show and read all the scripts. We have a consultant who reads all our scripts. His name is Dr. Darnell Hunt. Um, he's the head of sociology. I think he just became the chair of the entire department at UCLA. Um, so we, from the very beginning, were very conscientious about getting it right. Not that we wanted to be swayed into, you know, against telling something that, you know, we didn't want to be told, don't do this, don't do that. We wanted to tackle the hard topics and then have when, someone tell us, all right, this is off, or you better think about this. And so he's, he read every script we've ever done. Um, that, that he'll read the table draft version of it. Uh, just as a gut check, as someone who's not in the business and isn't a, you know, a writer and is not an executive, just to say, okay, here's the way the world is working. Here's what you need to be aware of. If you're gonna tell this story about you know, police brutality, if you're gonna tell the story about transgender rights, if you're gonna tell a story about whatever, here's what's going on in the world. So that, I, I, you know, I think that was, a, is, was an extremely good idea that Gerard had and is a really valuable part of us um, not only coming from an authentic place, as we already talked about here, but making sure that someone else is kind of helping us gut check. I mean, we, we have military consultants um, who we, we don't always do a show. I mean, we, most of them are not about military issues, but that is our main character's background and also her ex-husband. So we want to get those, you know, some of the language right and make sure that they don't sound like they're, you know, that, that, that people, that, that their backgrounds become clear and, um, are specific, um, 
and then just from a representation standpoint, you know, like we made our, our room has to speak with a voice that is talking about the culture, a culture that they know. I, I can't be that person, you know. He is not Latino. <laughs> He's very not sad about yet. it. <laughs> He's working on it. Have He's working on it. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it's uh, that show can't be written by a bunch of white guys. And uh, no show be, should be written by a bunch of white guys. But um, that's... <laughs> Yes, I'm the hero for saying that. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna leave. But we, in any case, we made sure to, you know, to have uh, our writing staff, uh, you know, filled with people who could uh, provide that point of view. Yeah, the trick of the trick of our show uh, is that the issues really aren't where we start. You know, it's sort of like if you're gonna have a, a bunch of like articulate black kids at an Ivy League, like they're literally gonna be talking about this stuff anyway. So, the place that we start is um, because we do see ourselves as a satire. Is what do we want to satirize in this season? Like, what is the sort of thing that is aff affecting all of the characters? Um, and then this first season, what we really wanted to get into is like 21st century activism, because it was one of those things that was both like wildly exciting and incredibly depressing at the same time. And even more so, you know, we wrapped on election day and it was sort of like, God, was it all for naught, you know? And uh, spoiler alert, you know, there are moments in the show where the characters feel that way. And um, so that kind of was like our, our overarching sort of thing for the plot, but at the, at the heart of Dear White People, is this idea of like self versus identity. Like who you really are versus the role that you have to play in society. And for people of color, or any marginalized group of people, that role is kind of decided for you by, by the culture. And um, so really what we asked ourselves with each episode is well how can we talk about this thing through a very personal story about this character who happens to be entangled in this sort of larger thing that's happening. And you know, by nature of who Sam White is, she's gonna be talking about all sorts of things. You're gonna to get to be a fly on the wall in all kinds of conversations that these characters would naturally be having. And there are moments where, you know, like you guys said, like we'll, be talk we'll just be fired up about something in the writer's room and it's just a really juicy conversation to sort of put over the subtext of what's happening in the scene, which usually has to do with like, you know, so-and-so like so-and-so and they wanna get with so-and-so but she's embarrassed to show her white boyfriend to the black. It, there's like, the subtext is what it's really about. Um, but they're sort of, and the kind of point that we're making is like it's it's impossible to be a black person or to be a person of color trying to figure out who you are without sort of getting caught up in all of these greater forces of oppression. Sorry, I want, want not to go there, but that's what it is, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we we're we're very character first, but then there is sort of a running list of of jokes and conversation topics and and uh, and issues that would be great to get into, but that's sort of like secondary for us. Yeah, it almost seems like when these things are baked into the DNA of the show when I saw the play Superior Donuts by Tracy Letts. You know, I, the thing that appealed to me about ad adapting it as a series was you can't not talk about these issues. Yeah. If you're doing a show set in a gentrifying neighborhood in Chicago that has police officers and a young African-American uh, uh, character and we added the, we added the, the uh, the Iraqi immigrant character, but you can't, if it, it would be dishonest to not address these issues. And I, but I think that comes from how you, how you build the show from the beginning, I think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, um, you all, you brought up the election, you mentioned that you wrapped your writer's room the day after the uh, election? No, we wrapped um, the last episode on election day. Wow. So we entered the day like super excited, <laughs> <laughs> feeling so accomplished. And I think like we were shooting like we were shooting like one of the defamation scenes and literally like um, <laughs> I mean like everyone was falling apart like it was like is someone going to call action like what's happening <laughs> and you know there was a moment where we had to, like the actors went away and said okay the world is happening but you and I are right now in this like radio station and you and I are right now the president of the United States making out in a prison uh, defamation is a, is a show within my show anyway um, and uh, that's what's happening right now we will deal with the rest of this later and I sort of had to have a powwow with the crew for the same reason because we were literally just falling apart um, but what was so cool about it is <laughs> Silver lining is that, you know, a week or so later when I got into the post, like all of these kind of asides and all of these fly on the wall conversations suddenly had an urgency that we just could not have predicted in that writer's room. Um, we'll have a side panel about defamation because I just died when I saw that. Did, are you all familiar? It's like the show within like Scandal. It is phenomenal. 
Um, I'd watch that separately just to let Netflix know. Same. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Netflix, y'all listening? <laughs> Um, but the rest of you all also, I mean, you all were between seasons when it happened. Um, and, and you said you had wrapped the first season? Uh, Bob? No, we were in the, right in the middle. We were right filming. Right in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, how does it, how has the election changed what goes on in the writer's room or how you find stories or just even the, the feeling of importance that you all have about what you're doing there now? I, I mean, just quickly, I, I'll just say for me, it's sort of, brought up to the surface all the things that we've been talking about already and the things that honestly like a lot of black folks have not had the luxury to ignore for a long time and everybody now is sort of awakened to the fact that American racism literally can lead to the collapse of global politics. Your health care can get stripped away because some people are racist against black people and I think that there's just a lot more people open to that conversation now um, and so for us it's sort of like okay, great, well now we can go even further. We can now push it even farther because hopefully more people are willing to hear you know, some of the things that are going on with these kids' lives. Yeah, we are, our season two finale, which aired a year ago um, in the summer was about Trump. So we, before, and it was, and it was still um, in the primaries and so, it, but it was all about how divisive Trump was and how, what would you do? You know what a family does when people are on different sides. But I mean, at that point, our character um, Maxine was was still a Bernie, so Bernie was still in the race, and there were so many fun things to talk about. And you know, um, so we we had an interesting experience where we kind of front loaded and said everything we had to say about Trump and about thinking. And everyone in the room at the time was like. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, especially the stand-ups in our room kept saying, but what if, you know, just imagine what if, and so we had, we felt like we had got it done, and I think in some ways it was easier to have done it already, because it, once it became real, we were shooting, we shot the night, we were in pre-production uh, during the election, but we shot the night of the inauguration, which was actually a very, um, it was a really, it was just a really tough episode and night. That episode was about, if you, I don't know if people saw or uh, have seen, we're on TV now, you guys. Um, uh, our, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, our premiere, it was called, it was an episode called Yes Means Yes, and it was about rape culture and, um, you know, the idea of teaching about yes and not just no. And because Hillary lost, <laughs> uh, you know, the way we were seeing women at the time and especially on that day, it was a, it was a very, um, just very weird, tough day to make a, a half hour comedy. And I think what we took out of it was, we're really proud of that episode, laughing at hard things is very helpful. And I think that that's what our show is always trying to do. I think that's what all, all the shows, uh, you know, uh, up here, um, are doing and so it it was a very stressful day that produced I think a good episode um, you know and so we felt it in that way I would say I, it's it's I don't know what it, this may sound facile or something I'm not even sure I know what that word means um, <laughs> so right there um, but it's you know when, when you're storytelling the whole thing's like you got to raise the stakes that's just the phrase you use raise the stakes are the stakes high enough and I really feel like the way Trump has infected the, the election infected is like he raised the stakes on life. Like the whole world is different. Mm -hmm. Like you just feel it when we're breaking stories. It's like there's shit happening that you weren't thinking about before the election. And this is in a way that yes, I also become aware, more aware. I try to become more aware every day of my privilege. But there is, I do feel like there's like an awakening, you know, uh, because there's stuff that 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 especially uh, Latino characters that people have to worry about that they weren't worried about beforehand. You know, there are just- Gloria has done a number on you, my <laughs> I can just see her over there. She has like, see you working? Oh, I see what's happening over there. Yeah, I, 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 I um, He's so woke now, you guys. He's so I, woke. I, I really, I can't, the, the worst word to say. Um, no, it's, so I don't know, it's, I'm not being very articulate, but it's like, I just feel like life is like, is an emergency. 
<laughs> right now. And so these stories just mean more and you feel like there's a lot, of, I guess what I'm saying is like there's political things that may have felt like they were external things and they're all internal things now. They're all real, you know, to, uh, and they should have been real before, but now you have a guy in charge who is making them uh, crises is what I'm saying. That one is, I hope you know what I'm talking about. Oh, no, absolutely. And this is on, that's honestly not the first time I've heard it this weekend about like all, like I knew these things were problems, but now I feel like I'm listening in a whole new way. And I feel like that's almost what your shows do as a whole. Like all of a sudden I'm listening in a different way. I, I was always aware of a problem and all of a sudden I'm seeing it differently because I've seen Dear White People or because I've seen Superior Donuts. And it's, I think that's what's beautiful about what all you do. Um, I want to talk about, uh, perspective because all of you have shows with very strong points of view and in that invites people to criticize your point of view. Um, what sh episode that you all have done has in, you know, riled up people the most or you've had the most feedback from uh, via the internet or Twitter, all these wonderful places where people express their very strong opinions? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's with Twitter, you get it instantly, which is terrible. <laughs> which is like, it's terrible, because if you go on there, you can see, this show sucks, and this isn't funny. I don't know why anyone's saying this is funny. And, you know, um, Gerard, I don't know why anyone would be with Gerard. He's a horrible boyfriend. You know, I love, I actually love seeing those. Like, that's so funny. People are so angry. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think I, I think for all can only speak for for our show and NBC would have to correct me if I'm wrong. I th amazingly, and maybe it's just how few people have seen it, but amazingly, we have not had a lot of negative blowback. And I think that reason for us is we have six characters and they are always presenting a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So if you are angry with Maxine, you're going to agree you know, with, with Loretta's, with Loretta's character, and you might, you know, you, you might think Nikisha is nuts, but you love her, and then, you know, so it's kind of like, at least what we try and do is, is to your question about point of view, is present six different points of view, and I think in our ability to do that, we've been able to tackle really difficult things with nobody saying much, and for that matter, we've never been turned down on a story ever from the from the network or, or studio. We've always gotten to do, including we did a Cosby episode, which was our, the beginning of season two, um, at the network that Cosby built, you know, and I think the reason we got to do it is because there were so many different perspectives in it that they were just like, okay, okay. You know, so you, you know, so I, so I, I, so we've been very lucky that other than people on Twitter just calling us out and saying they don't like us globally, I don't think we've had a lot of you know blowback. Yeah, and well, we've had we've had a similar angry. thing on our show because we have different points of view. We have a you know older grandmother who has a much more traditional Catholic faith-based point of view, and then you know the. Penelope character uh, is somewhere in the middle and then her daughter is super, super liberal and very PC. And so, w again, if somebody's upset with one point of view, they'll, they'll be... Yeah, it was, the, the, I think it, it was Breitbart. I think Breitbart ran an episode that it was so funny because it did this loop-de-loop because we had a scene about Che Guevara, che Guevara, che Guevara right. which if you're taking sides, it sort of had a sort of conservative... You know, at least some conservatives favor would have favored that point of view, and so it was like this liberal trash show did this one good thing, you know, <laughs> and because they they oh finally Hollywood gets to learn the truth blah blah blah, but then later in the episode they did this thing that we hated and they you know went back into there. I mean, we got most of the shit from people who haven't seen the show. Um, <laughs> You know, pe uh, both people who are having honest knee-jerk reactions, but also people who are sort of like trying to politicize this so that they can build followers or whatever. Um, but I'll say, you know, our episode five has gotten the most, uh, I would say, conversation going on the internet. Uh, and, and really, it's not controversial. It's, it's a lot of, oh my God, like... This Quickly exactly. tell people what, explain for season Well, five. I don't, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to okay. say much. You don't want to spoil it. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say that episode five really is the midpoint of our first season, and there's a big tonal shift there. And um, people who sort of, there's a lot of people who got to see themselves in that episode in a way that was haunting and unexpected, and there were people who truly just didn't understand that aspect of the black experience until they saw the episode. Um, but the episode that I've gotten shit about from people who have seen the show is our episode uh, seven that actually follows the point of view of one of the white characters. 
Um, you know, and it's not like white men, don't, you know, have a shortage of point of views in television. But I thought what was interesting, the, you know, the, the reason why I wanted to do it is because, you know, there's I, I want there's this guy who you can't help but love, but he is inadvertently uh, contributing to a racist system that he personally loathes. And he in turn becomes a victim of that same system. And I just thought that, I, I feel like if we're really gonna have an honest conversation about race, we, all of us have to start looking at things and talking about things that honestly don't necessarily fit our worldview. Because that's really how we got here, is that we are all coming from points of views and we are just so blind to, our, to everyone else's point of view that we can't seem to even be on the same sort of like table. We can't get to the same table to have the conversation. Um, and so, you know, again, it was character first. It's like, you know, what would, what, would, what would Gabe do in the aftermath of this moment that happens in chapter five? But then on top of that, we were able to really layer what that experience is of being sort of like a white ally surrounded by black people who are in turn surrounded by a bunch of white people. Like, what does that feel like? It's sort of like an inverse Oreo or something. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I'm really proud of that episode because I don't think a lot of people expected us to do that. Yeah, it was great. Bob, anything there? I'm just echoing what Danielle said. I, I don't think I would have any interest in writing for a show where all seven characters voted for Hillary. I mean, I think it's yeah. very important. For, and we're, you and I are both on a network, too, yeah. which I think makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. Um, you know, we follow the Matt LeBlanc show, mm -hmm. uh, which is a family show and a very traditional kind of multicam. So we're like, the, we're like a starter sitcom for <laughs> social uh, awareness. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, um, but I think it's very important to us whenever we construct. If, if, if there's not one character arguing the the inverse of the of a of a of a subject, I think we're not gonna we're not gonna deal with it. It's just not it's not it's not worth it because then you're shooting fish in a barrel, which is that was my biggest issue with social media after the election was I felt like I'm on Facebook with 500 people who are all arguing the exact yeah. same point. Like why are we arguing with each other? Like we all agree with each other. Why are we doing that? So I think that's kind of how I approach the show a little bit too. Is like let's let's have an argument. Let's have somebody take the other side and, and let, let's make sure that they have a valid argument in some way. You know, if they, if they don't, again, we shouldn't be doing that issue. If there's only one side to the issue and there's no plausible argument to the contrary, then don't bother. Right. I want to talk about the networks and, and just how you all work with because Because obviously everybody hears that Netflix is very easy to work with and they kind of let you take the reins. But do they have feedback about certain things? And how do you all work with your networks, respective networks, about stories, about... Um, issues that you want to take on. CBS has been real, they, and they're, they're not even here, so I'm not. He's not even sucking up. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but they've been very supportive, as Danielle said too. They they actually push us. They they want it to be about issues. They I think they like the fact that they have a show on the air that's sort of about you know can talk, can speak to issues that are in the news. So they've been. I have to. I have no horror stories. They've been really supportive. We we follow Little Big Shots, which is a talent show for children, <laughs> and our premiere episode was about rape. So that's all I have to say. Yes, rape. Sorry, that wasn't. Um, here's the thing. We I don't know. Maybe you have to be David Fincher to get the like hands off Netflix thing. We were they were very hands on. But I have to be honest with you, it was kind of great because it was never like make these changes because we're afraid or do this because, you know, this demographic or that demographic. It was really all about just pushing us to make sure that we were telling great stories and, you know, making sure that we were going as far as we could go. So it really was, I would say it was a, it was a true um, collaboration. They ask a lot of questions. Um, sometimes just to see if we have the answers. Uh, but especially with a show like ours, which is a bit atypical, even for Netflix, yeah, they were very involved in that process. I never felt like they got in the way, but they were certainly in the room, for sure. Oh, wow. Yeah. Not physically, but you know what I mean, proverbially. <laughs> They're always watching, yes. Justin. Yeah. <laughs> they were taped. Um, yeah, they were, they were uh, yeah, they're great. I mean, I will say they, they, they don't feel the pressure to, like, develop your show for their brand. They just want you to do a good show. So they have opinions. Yeah. Um, but it works well, you know, we're a um, uh, Sony show for Netflix, and it helps that Netflix, you know, they, in the pilot, I think they, you know, had more uh, notes than probably uh, for the rest of the series even, but we pitched everything out pretty specifically, and they gave us specific notes when they had them, Most, mostly they were overview, but it's, it works really well because when the network is relaxed, 
the studio doesn't feel the need to then also, you know, get, be, they also relax. So the whole, the sort of circle of trust uh, started to happen very quickly and the experience has been, you know, really everyone rooting for the show uh, that we're doing as opposed to someone trying to make it something is not. Right. One interesting tidbit I will give, we're doing a family show. And so in the pilot, we have a joke where, well, we had a joke where the main character said, just because I was ranting one day to Mike, and I was like, that's some Jesus shit right there, right? So we put that joke in, and we thought, oh my gosh, this is a great opportunity. We're on Netflix. We can swear the way you would swear in a family, and then immediately go, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry I said that. That's not okay to say. The way you would do in your house, in front of your kids. So we were excited to tell that joke, and then Netflix pulled us aside and said, you can totally do the joke, but we want you to know that this is the pilot episode. None of the other stories or episodes you've turned in have swearing in them, so you're not gonna be a show that's gonna swear. People will watch that episode and think, oh, this is a show that swears, maybe I can't watch this with my kids, and you'll probably lose like a million people. Up to you. Oh my God. <laughs> what do you wanna do? So we, we changed the show. Yeah. Changed. They're By like the, way, the, the joke ultimate killed. mom and dad. <laughs> Sorry, it was it was the joke destroyed, but nonetheless, yeah. yeah. No, it's so that's like the ulti- that's like saying uh, we're disappointed in you, and you're like, yeah. oh god, that's worse. Yeah. Just be mad at me. Um, I want to talk about um, sort of what episode that you all have done that you are the most proud of because it was either a heavy lift or something that was very deep and, and personal to you all. They're all such heavy lifts. I have questions. <laughs> um, in season one, we did an episode about a transgender um, kid that I am particularly proud of. That was very personal to my life. I have a transgender nibbling, um, which is the term for a transgender niece or nephew is nibbling. Um, and we, we were able to do it in a way that was relevant to our characters, which I thought was really um, fun and interesting. I, I know I was proud that we did the Cosby episode, and the reason that made me proud is that we were told no first, and then Gerard and I said we're going to write it, and then if if we write it and we give it to you, even though you're telling us not to do it, will you just read it with an open mind? And they did, and everyone told us we would never get that, we would never get to make that episode. There was no way NBC was going to let us make that episode, and we did. Um, and I and I, I think it's important for the types of shows that we're making that you don't hear it, that you don't just take a no. I mean, a joke, look, I, we've had to change jokes. That's not, I mean, about subject matter, about a story that you really want to tell. Um, and I think TV is really moving in this direction, and I think it's because of streaming, and there's just so many great shows that people can kind of stand up and say, no, this ha- we have to talk about this, so let's work together and figure out how can we talk about, you know, how can we talk about this thing? So, so but I'm proud that we turned a no into a yes. That's probably the best. We did a, uh, a stop and frisk episode, and you know we have two um, the characters in our show are Chicago cops. Um, so, and one of them is a young African American Chicago cop. So, we were able to have an interesting discussion between his, his character and Jermaine Fowler's about like how how do you defend? How can you possibly be a cop in Chicago with with all this going on? We actually did a joke in the pilot. You were talking about like the joke that you're that you're worried about. We had a joke in the pilot where Jermaine Fowler is going to take, take a painting off the wall and he turns, Katie Segal plays a cop and he turns around and he turns back and he says, I must really trust you, I just turned my back on a Chicago police officer. Which we were like, that could either, that, we had a lot of alts ready for that joke on tape night. <laughs> but it actually, it, and Jermaine is so charming that there was, a beat, there was like a beat and then it got a giant laugh and that was when we kind of knew. Um, but we also are, we're, are, have been very conscious because that's the blowback we've gotten, I think is we have gotten some, some people that were concerned that we were maybe anti, anti-cop. And so I think I, I'm proud of that episode because I feel like we sort of, while pointing out the, the perils of stop and frisk, we also showed the difficulties of being a, a police officer. And I, we, I, I think we tried to cover you know, both sides of that issue. His delivery on that line, like, totally sold it. Because oh right now, I was like, I heard it as him, and I laughed, and some people were like, oh. And I was like, no, you need to hear it as him. Yeah. But uh, no, uh, Jermaine, again, that, that, it's the charm of the actor. He that, is. Yeah. He's so good. Um, I mean, a lot has been said about our episode five, and I and I am very proud of it. I'm I'm so proud that we got Barry Jenkins to direct it. Um, I'm proud that I got my Quentin Tarantino rant in it. No shade, a <laughs> little bit of shade. Um, 
But I gotta say, personally, on a personal level, because episode five is, is the shit, okay? But <laughs> on a personal level, episode two for me was really satisfying because I got to direct it um, and uh, wrote it, and it's about you know Lionel Higgins, who is this character who isn't having sex, but he's gay, and he's coming to terms with his sexuality when there are no versions of him anywhere. Like, there's no, like, version of black and gay and masculine out there around him. And, you know, I was able to really dive deeply, <laughs> pun not intended, into his sexuality <laughs> um, in an in-your-face your face kind of way that made it very awkward for me to watch the premiere next to my mom. <laughs> but I just felt like this is stuff that, again, I don't see anybody else talking about. And if I had this episode of television when I was 14 or 15, it would have it would have changed my life, and there's people in my life who are no longer here that it would have saved their lives. So, like for me, like that episode was very, very personally gratifying um, to make, uh, you know, because again, it was our second episode, so they could have easily have told us the same thing and said, you know what, like you don't want to lose people in the second episode. Like people are here, like you know, fuck the man, like charged up about what Sam did, and now we're going into this personal journey about Lionel's sexuality. Um, but for me, it was just so important, and uh, I'm glad they let me get away with it um yeah we uh had a coming out storyline i wouldn't i wouldn't pin it to one episode that i'm particularly proud of but uh my daughter is gay and she uh you talk <laughs> uh it was really cool doing this process because when we originally conceived of the show we hadn't really we were sort of getting and talking about these characters and Mike's daughter was coming out at the time, and it just fit so perfectly with this young girl that we were talking about. And so to be able to see his journey as the dad who wanted to do everything right as his kid was coming out, and to be able to infuse the show with that was so uh, empowering and, and made it... Because it's obviously really personal for me. It's like a Latino show. It's basically my mom and I on screen every week. But he has the same level of connection with it because it's, it's in a large way his kids are the kids. So we've really perfectly meshed our families together. And so it's a real labor of love uh, for both of us in that way. And so we have the journey of the coming out, because there's like the coming out episode in a lot of, <laughs> like if there is a gay character, there's like one episode where they get to come out and we really uh, were schooled by our, our, our gay writers who told us like, yeah, it'd be cool to kind of see the journey, you know, to see the character, a young girl, kind of questioning her sexuality. So we have an episode where she's just like, huh, I think I might like girls, I'm not sure. And then to see the journey progress where she's really coming into her own and do it slowly as it would be. And, uh, and then to have her come out to her mother and what that was like to have her come out to her grandmother and what that very Catholic woman and what that was like and then come out to her father uh, and, and... I want to be clear, the story, it's not just it's unrelenting not coming out. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's more clever than that. Other stuff's going on too. <laughs> but uh, it was really, uh, it, it was really emotional, I think, for all of us and, and, you know, I have two young children, I don't know what their sexuality is, but certainly in making it, I thought, gosh, I... Whoever they are, I want them, I, I, they will be able to watch this in the future and know that they are loved regardless. And that's a really special story to get to tell. So uh, I think that for me, the, the quinceanera episode and the final episode, she has a quinces. I robbed my parents of a quinces. <laughs> I was the daughter who was like, it's misogynist and I'm not doing it. I want a car. <laughs> um, and now all I want is for my daughter who's nine to have a quinces. <laughs> Like, I hope she does it. It's such a beautiful tradition. Uh, so, I, I, my parents are in the Kinsas episode, too, so I feel like this is your Kinsas. You got it. I did it for you. Uh, so, there was, a lot, uh, there was a lot of stuff that happened in that episode that was uh, both touched so much on the Cuban experience and also on this young girl and family and, and people coming together and ultimately love winning out, which is, is how we got to end our season, which was great. And I, I just got to say, like, it's so, I said this on our last panel, but, like, 
this shit like saves lives, like for real. Like it is so powerful, especially in the context of a show about people of color to deal with like, a trans issue, to deal with coming out. Like we don't talk about that stuff in our communities enough. Yeah, we had a we had a uh, episode about mental illness, uh, just about yeah. depression that that got a huge response from from all different, uh, you know, from the black community, but from from all over the place. That it's just because certainly in the Latino community too, that's mental health is not something that you talk about. You get over it. You deal with the shit, and you, you know you move on, and um, and that was that was really a, that was a really nice response to hear from people that they, that it mattered that we gave a character that kind of issue. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, because it's like you know, white characters do it all the time. Not all the time, but like you, you sort of <laughs> you see. I mean, you know, you see the you see that in a, a show with a predominantly white cast a lot more often. Um, because usually when you're dealing with a cast of color, like their race is like the primary thing the show is about. Um, so like it was, it, it's it's just it's cool to see you guys doing that and to sort of just you know know that it's making a really big impact and it's just it's great. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to get a quick poll of how many people have questions because I want to leave enough time for everybody. Two. Okay, let's get audience questions. Um, <laughs> um, when I point to you, just go ahead and stand up and speak loudly. I don't know if we, I don't think we have a mic. So, um, yeah, just we'll start here with Mr. and Hat. Yep. Well, um, first of all, thank y'all so much for creating and continuing to give work to marginalized communities. Um, as an actor of color, that means a lot. Also, being um, Latinx, um, how do you work in a business, or how do you get your own stories told? How do you create in a business that is predominantly white? Uh, what has been your, I guess, success stories with that? This is super interesting, because I've had this debate with people before. I think whatever is your comfortable way in is, is the way for you. For me, I had to, and, and I'm not saying this is the way, but this is, looking back now, this is what I did. I had to show them I could be them first. Like the first room I went into, it, they, I was a diverse writer, which means that I was free to them. Me too. I was the diversity hire, right? So when you come in, it's like you're the diversity hire. There is this like stigma of, oh, you're just here because your last name's Calderon. Okay. So it was like, uh-uh, I'm gonna show you I'm just as good as you are. And that's what I would try to do. I would try to hang with the boys. I would sit there while they watched their YouTube videos and their naked girl pictures and I'd totally be chill. And I would, I was like, I have to get through this because I know where I wanna go. So I'm gonna do this because I know where I'm going. So that was how I did it. I felt like, I, I think there's people that can, that have a story to tell that can tell it today right now and have that. I needed to understand, I needed to learn by doing. So for me, being in the room in any capacity was so helpful. So I rose the ranks. I was a staff writer and then a story editor and an executive story editor and a co-producer and a producer and a supervising producer. I did that whole path until finally I was like, all right, now I feel ready. I know how to do this and I'm gonna do it the way I wanna do it now. And luckily I had somebody who was so supportive of that. Uh, but that was the way in and I don't, I, I know writers who, I was on a, I was on a staff with a woman um, who is Latinx as well and it was the first time I'd ever been on a staff with another Latinx writer. And I adored her so much and I remember her pulling me aside afterwards because we were called Spick and Span on that show. Um, and I would make jokes about, I would make jokes about it. And she would leave and like be bawling. And she's like, I don't understand how you can make jokes. And I was like, oh man, I'm doing her a disservice because I have so taken this thing that I've made people think it's okay and it's not okay. And that's on me to change it. Uh, but what I was doing was for my own survival along the way. So from that point on, you know, I would make different, you know, I did, th this is also the room where like I couldn't, uh, breastfeed in the room. I, I couldn't leave to breastfeed for 30 minutes uh, because I was taking a 30 minute break. So I started breastfe I started pumping in the room. Uh, so it's we have to endure stuff, unfortunately. And, uh, but I have been schooled. I, I think, I hope so much that by doing the things that we're doing and telling these kinds of stories and populating not just in front of the camera but behind the camera with inclusive, 
uh, groups of people that, that it will be easier for the next batch of people that come along the way, and, and hopefully it won't be a problem for that much longer. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say that my, my parents both were born in East L.A., and if anyone knows Los Angeles, that is not where Hollywood is. <laughs> um, there is no nepotism from there. I had no in to the business, but what I did have was my dad was, both my parents were extremely hard workers, and my dad, knowing, because he was first generation, so I'm second, um, he said, everyone's going to think you're getting there because... So work harder than the person on your left, work harder than the person on your right, and show everybody that that's not why. And I use that in school, I use that in, in life, in every job, and that actually has served me more for success in Hollywood than any, any advice anyone has given me inside the industry. Just work harder than everybody around you, whether you're an actor, director, writer, producer, it, that actually works. Yeah, I'm going to echo that. It, for me, it, you know, the way I describe it is you, you have to adopt a kind of hooker by crook mentality because you're, you're not, there isn't a way. There's not. Like, there's not a, like a set list of things to do. And everybody that you ask is going to have a completely different story. So you just have to like either have an idea that is worth literally giving everything that you have to make it happen, um, or you just have to like just naturally be inclined to be that kind of person, whatever it takes. Um, you know, for me, I had this really dense multi-protagonist script about the black experience. Ain't nobody checking for that, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it was like, well, there's no getting a manager off of this. This is not a spec script that you sell and like get representation off of. So, you know, for me, it was like putting some, some coins together from my tax return, making a concept trailer as if it were a movie. And that happened to go viral. But you know what? If it didn't go viral, I would have come up with something else to do. It was just sort of like, what can I do today? I remember like buying like film finance books at like Barnes and Nobles back when that existed. And, you know, it was like highlighting and trying to figure out how the hell to make a movie, uh, you know, on a, from a financial standpoint. But it was really just deciding one day, like if it takes me 20 years, like so be it. Like I'm gonna make this happen. And really once you, once you decide that, the rest sort of, you're gonna figure out the next steps and then you'll be on a panel telling people how you did it. But it's really not, there's no one way, especially for us. Cause there isn't, there is not nepotism. Like I don't know, but I don't have any parents in the industry, you know. There's no legacy of that in my family. No one in my family really understood what it meant to make a living as an artist until I did it. Um, you know, so we, you just have to have the courage and sort of the tenacity to just make it happen, period. That's great. I like hats today, sorry, just you're next, yeah. So, uh, socially conscious sitcoms, I feel like, tend to be more liberal than science, and I was wondering if you could get a response about Tim Allen's sitcom that came out that was more conservatively slanted, and you know, how those have a place, I guess, in Hollywood that they do. Well, it was yeah. just canceled. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was on, that was on, right, it well, was. Well, it wasn't canceled for that reason. It was on for Shade. Se <laughs> se <laughs> <laughs> How many seasons was it? How many seasons? Six. We went for six it was seasons. On six. Six seasons. Yeah. I mean, I and it was for partly scheduling reasons. I will say on NBC, uh, ABC's defense. Do you work for ABC? No, I just listened. Kidding. I asked her the question. Actually. No, no. <laughs> um, I I think that uh, there is a place for all voices on, on TV. I mean, I think there always has been. Archie Bunker is, you know, a, a, as racist as you could possibly be. And I'm not comparing that to the Tim Allen show. I'm saying that's a, who, who's going to put that on TV, and then it and then it got there. And I think the reason it did is because then there was a, a liberal foil so that no one was right and no one was wrong. Um, our, Joe Carmichael, the dad on our show, voted for Trump, which has come up a lot, which has come up for the actor a lot because that because you know that's a that's a tough place to be in Hollywood when you're playing a character who voted for Trump. Um, but we didn't shy away from it because that's what we said the character did, and and we're all believe different things in this world. And I think there's if the show is funny and it's a completely conservative, just like, just as conservative as could be, I think you could get that show on TV. I, because if it's funny and smart and has a, what shows need are distinct points of view. And there's nothing wrong with that point of view, especially if it's challenged by somebody else. Um, I don't think there's ever not been a place for, the, for those shows. That's my opinion. It's true though, we've, we've had that, a similar experience where it's hard to find when we drop an issue into our little fishbowl, it's hard to find the actor who's willing to play the pro, the anti-gun control, yeah. you know, yeah. take, that, take that stance. I mean, it does, you know, and that's a challenge I think that we find is that I think 
our writers room voted for Hillary Clinton. I think our actors voted for Hillary Clinton. So it is sometimes antithetical to our nature to, to represent that point of view, but I think it's, I actually think it's really important. And again, to me, a show is not interesting if it's not presenting all, both sides of you. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's boring to sort of just be dogmatic. I mean, it's like, it's not fun to watch a show like that. It's not fun to make a show like that. You know, literally some of the things that the trolls who haven't watched my say, haven't watched my show say about my title, that literally goes into dialogue in, for some of the characters that like really hate what Sam is doing in the world of the show. Because I think that's interesting. It's like, I wanna have a conversation. I don't wanna sort of preach. So yeah, it's sort of like, you know, there are conservative voices in my show uh, that have really valid points. And um, you know, I, it also depends on what you mean by conservative, because I think that, the definition of what that means has changed very rapidly in the past few years. Um, but again, like if there, uh, any show that sort of represents both sides and is entertaining and makes you think, and you know, I don't know that it has to be liberal or conservative. It's just thought provoking, and I'm here for that kind of TV, like whatever it is. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's go with you in the back with the white shirt. Um, actually, to continue sort of the conversation you're just having, though, how do you present those viewpoints without legitimizing or validating them, especially when some viewpoints are genuinely harmful and rooted in the oppression of other people? So how do you present those sort of, whether it's conservative, whatever the both sides are, without pretending that they're equal or on the same level in any way? I think, um, just really quick, I think, I think part of it is that the discussion that people are having in the show, like that's not how you prove a point or sort of put forth a theme. Like if you, if, if you do the right thing is like, I love going back to it, or it's a master class on how to do this. Because you literally have characters in that show from every race yelling racial epithets at the screen at a certain point. Sal, who um, you know, owns the pizzeria where Radio Rahim is killed at, is a nice guy, but he's driven to a point where he, you know, says a really horrible thing. And you get how he gets there, you get how everybody gets to where they get, but at the end of the day, a tragedy has occurred. An unarmed black man was killed by the police. And you, and you see, like, what are the underpinnings that got us there? It's not really, it doesn't really even matter what the opinions of the characters are. It's, it, it is the, the nature of humanity that we're sort of exploring here and how we get into these situations as opposed to sort of like arguing a point. And I think that like, you know, especially in the Twitter era, we're all set up to sort of just listen to dialogue as if that's the only thing that we're watching, but what we're watching is people's lives. You know, um, in, especially in a sitcom where, you know, the, the characters are having these really interesting discussions, we forget that it really is about their relationships. It's about the characters themselves. That's what's putting forth, you know, the theme or the, you know, what it is that we're trying to say about the human condition. So I think it's really important to sort of pay attention to that, what happens in a show, as opposed to just what people are talking about. That's how we do it. I drank three of these and I have to go to the bathroom, so I'm going to be right back. <laughs> um, I'm a mom since having kids. Guys, it's not the same. I'll be right back. That's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think with our with our show, the purpose is discussion. So we're so we're not out to tell anybody how the world works. And I I think TV doesn't do that. I think TV introduces a world like just taking away from what's like Will and Grace kind of you know a lot of people cite that as opening the door for oh you might not have a gay friend but here are some on TV. Now there are certainly people who have been critical, but either way it was an introduction to and our you know our Trump episode was very it was very hard to tell. There were a lot there was a lot of fighting within the writers. There were some writers who didn't want and this was before so this was way before he wasn't the candidate yet. There were some writers who were just like there's no way we should be doing this. Um, but not everybody felt that way because what the whole point of that episode was, for us at least, or what, you know, what we were trying to get across was, we need to be able to have dialogue no matter what. And so I think the only way to have a discussion is to give a character, a, even if you don't get it at all, as legitimate a point of view as possible because people have that, those thoughts, even if they're not yours. And I think, you know, sometimes, I think it's a dangerous place to get tripped up and only present your own points of view because what we tried to do with that episode was give Joe Carmichael a real reason to vote for Trump, not a make America great and it's all silly. He said political stuff about why he might be voting for a conservative candidate and that was important that he have a leg to stand on because otherwise you're not really having a discussion. You know, so, it, so I, I, I think, um, it's important to talk about everything, I guess, is, is what, how I see it. 
um, versus, you know, being fearful that you're going to legitimize something. You're not wrong. You know, what you're, the, the question is a good one. But I think, I think that there are, just to keep using the Trump analogy, very smart people that you may know, that I may know, I certainly within your family, that voted for Trump. And if you're not someone who understands Trump, it's hard, you know, it, it's hard to understand, but it, that person's still in your family. That was kind of the point of our episode, um, not to say one way. No, we, we try not to come down on one side or the other, and I think that's how you avoid the thing that you're asking about, is just talk, just talk about it. And, and just what's powerful about that episode is that, like, you know, I've got people in my family, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and I think that, like, I think what's important about that is that you do have to understand how people get to where they get. It's not about necessarily legitimizing a certain point of view, but these people exist. This is a reality, um, and we can't sort of ignore it. We, I think we have to understand how they got there, not because they're right and, and you know we should bow down to their ideology, but if we don't understand how we got there, you know we can't sort of Pre prevent something like that from happening again. Like we, we can't have an honest conversation and that's what it takes in a country where, you know, everyone's involved in this process no matter how informed you may or may not be. Like we have to understand how everyone gets to where they get. I mean, it's sort of part of how we grow as people. Absolutely. Welcome back. Welcome back, but we do, that is all the time I think we have, unfortunately. But at least you, you came back for Gloria. the big finale. So guys, please give these wonderful panels a huge round of applause. Thank you guys, and thanks for coming.